Well, what a lovely day for the 1st of September, eh? Just like the end of August. Absolutely brilliant. Anyway, it's not a resident piper, it's the radio. So let me turn that down in case uh, YouTube get annoyed with uh, stealing copyright. What I was going to do today was... Um, I've got other stuff to load up, so I'm going to um, talk very briefly on a subject I kind of touch on. It's these kind of weird stories. That, um, uh, these ones are not actually mine, but uh, I'm, I'm ha happy to share them with you. Close that door, Andrew. Yeah, there was um, a chap, a local chap that once told me a story that, uh, that had been shared to him by um, a couple... I don't know if you know Locker and Head. Um, I'll put a couple of pictures up just to kind of let you see where I'm talking about. And hopefully I've got one of the viaduct that used to run. I mean, the, the Creef to Comrie to St. Fillins to Locker and Head railway line uh, ran until the 1960s. And um, certainly my father was a postman in the early days. He, he was a postman for 37 years, but uh, in his early apprenticeship, put it that way, he used to have to <clears throat> go up to St. Fillins and and he boarded the train up to collect mail coming down from uh, the west coast and stuff, you know, it was uh, brought in by train from Loch Iron Head. So he would be sitting at St. Fillins, uh, I can't remember if he said f uh, five in the morning or seven in the morning, he certainly started at five in the old days, I think they actually started at three in the morning at one time. But, um, <clears throat> The story uh, in, in relation to what I'm talking about is this couple had been standing, I can't give you what decade this was, but uh, let's assume it was in the 70s or 80s. Um, it, it wouldn't have been any any earlier or later, I don't think. But um, they had asked uh, someone uh, locally, um, they were surprised to see the trains still running um, between St. Fillin's and Loch Iron Head. And they were quickly uh, reminded that the trains hadn't run on that uh, track, uh, as I say, since the 1960s. And they were completely um, astonished to hear this because what they'd actually seen was a train <clears throat> going across the viaduct at Loch Iron Head that day. And uh, the chap had said to them, I think you're, <clears throat> you're very much mistaken. And they said, no, we, we definitely saw what we saw. We saw a train heading into Loch Iron Head from the, from the west, obviously from St. Fillins. Now, <clears throat> I, I have had um, stories in the past where I've been told about time slips and, and stuff like that, where people are, people and um, <clears throat> objects can become visible even at a different uh, space and time. So this was um, not not of a great surprise to me, and I think that's why the guy wanted to share me, because he knew I had, I had a, a keen interest in this type of phenomenon. But I, I, I never, was never able to trace the couple involved, but um, I thought that was highly interesting that they were able to witness this train going across the, uh, the viaduct. I mean, at Loch Iron Head, there was what they call a turntable, a turntable is where the, uh, the the like the steam engine or the or the front carriage the, the, the hauls the the rest the rest of the carriages um, actually goes on to the the turntable and the rest of the carriages are shunted forward of course uh, and it's re then it, it connected at the front to, to make the return journey fascinating bit of engineering actually. But the trains used to come from Stirling up to uh, through Callander and Strathair. These were all main main stations up past Bill Widow. Now my, my own grandfather, my mum's uh, father, uh, who I can obviously still remember, and uh, spoke to him. He was a he was a signalman with the railway, and he used to cycle to Bill Widow from Creef every morning, and I mean every morning, no matter what the weather was, he'd cycle until he eventually saved up to get a car. Uh, I think his, old, his first car was an old Austin. But uh, could you imagine cycling uh, almost 30 miles uh, each way? It's a 60 mile round trip every day just to get to your work. But um, 
So uh, my father will be able to show, share these stories about uh, you know, the postal services at St Fillings and my grandfather sharing the stories about uh, being a, a signalman at Bellwether Station. But the, um, that was the old days before automation and uh, they, they had to use these handheld um, levers to connect and change lines and stuff with different trains and that. But uh, the trains used to then haul themselves from Lockheed Head right up to Glen Ogle uh, onward. There was a station, um, it was a, a stop for Killin, but it wasn't actually in Killin. It was on the, it was on the very uh, west, sorry, the very east edge of um, Glen Docker. And um, it's, you know, it's mostly forestry or it's, it's suddenly, it's become deforested just in the last couple of years. A lot, a lot of trees cut down around about it. I don't think there's any, anything that visible. But the line itself from Glenogle would swing all the way around and, and then head on to Crane Larach and then open up to the, to the west coast, you know, either going to, uh, you know, Tyne Drum still has two stations. There was lower and upper, and the upper section took the trains to uh, onward to Fort William, and the lower, of course, went to take the trains to Auburn. And these, as I say, they're still auto, uh, auto operational. <clears throat> but the um, and Crane Larrack is still a, a a station, but not not like it used to be, of course, you know. And um, but certainly with Lock End Head. Uh, it was a very, very popular place for tourists to come and arrive, and there was a big hotel, um, strangely enough, called the Loch Ern Head Hotel, which was burnt down, completely burnt down, uh, back in the mid 1980s. Actually, on 5th of November, so it was a bit of a strange one, but uh, it actually, it was engulfing flames on bonfire night, and um, it was a fabulous big hotel. Uh, I'll try and I'll try and load a picture here for you of the front entrance. I, I can remember going in there. Uh, it was an absolutely fantastic building, and uh, oh, it was just just perfect. But um, so a lot, lot, lot of the heart of Strathern was lost when the trail the sort of trailways the railways were um, uh, dismantled. Uh, and most of that occurred uh, during the 1960s, mostly between 63 and 1968. Uh, I, I was reliably informed by mum that I was carried as a child on the railway, so I can always see I was on the Creef line. Um, <clears throat> although I think at that time it was diesel rather than steam. And um, But Creef itself, I mean, I had, uh, employed a lot of people. And back in the older days... Um, you know, everybody connected with the railways. I mean, there was, there was a huge amount of staff they had, but um, if you had a station master based at a particular location, well, the whole family lived there. Um, I mean, for example, my uh, mum was brought up at uh, the old railway cottages um, down in, um, in Creef, where it's presently a health centre and a hospital. That was the location of, of the uh, the railway uh, station and uh, obviously the, the station houses. Now, each station, um, the station master would take particular pride and joy in his own station. And as a result, uh, the paintwork uh, on all the buildings were always pristine. And they had, they treated the, the, the platforms like their own garden. So at a time like... Uh, well, it was never short of, of colours to display, whether that be the spring or summer. But you can imagine in, in a, the 1st of September when all these beautiful um, late summer and early autumn flowering plants were at, at their best. It must have been absolutely glorious to arrive at a, a train station. And that was, um, you know, equaled every every station in the country. It's just so sad to see all that go. 